the free trade agreements um, that we're going to be talking about, these are just some tendencies that I know about them. They tend to uh, give precedence to uh, free, so the, the rules of free trade, the agreements tend to tend to have precedence over um, like laws that have been passed at the national or local level to protect the environment or to protect people. It's kind of interesting because free trade agreements, usually there's two different kinds of arguments against them. There's the, the first argument that inherently using free market economics and these models of free trade and capitalism with uh, one country, which is as powerful and developed as the United States, which is a total farm state, um, and, and pushing that on another country that's developing, it inherently is going to have problems. You're going to force workers out of their jobs, you're going to threaten the environment, you're going to threaten small businesses, etc. Um, but there's another argument that what we have in NAFTA and many of our free trade agreements are, is not actually free trade. When you have $10 billion at least in subsidies going to the corn industry alone in the United States to keep prices low, and you have roughly $1 billion going to the same price supports in Mexico, that's what you call a barrier to entry in free market economics. It's a, it breaks the rules. And furthermore, you have a lot of um, incidences where the duties or the taxes or the levies that were supposed to be collected to transition Mexico into NAFTA's implementation were not collected um, for one reason or another. You had the peso crisis in 1994 where a lot of compromises were made on the original agreements of how that was supposed to happen. So that doesn't actually represent free trade. And um, in, in my research and a lot of the work I think a lot of people here have done around NAFTA, we see it, the problem is, is both. Um, really what it is is such extreme changes in the economies that societies can't really keep up with, that tradition can't really keep up with. And, um, and what we've really seen in Mexico and here in the United States too is a move from local production of traditional foods to a dependency on massive industrial agriculture, massive food production, and the import of more processed food which is really what the U.S. has seen over our lifetimes. We've seen ourselves move away from locally produced traditional food to mass-produced industrial production and processed foods. First, I just want to give pay homage to the, the importance of corn in Mexican culture. Um, 10,000 years plus, and that's actually even being debated now. You know, anthropologists are always saying, oh, actually, the societies are older than we thought in the beginning, but Mesoamerica is the birthplace of corn. It was, um, it was bred from the inflorescence, a tiny flower on a grass stalk, thousands and thousands of years ago by Mayan cultures. And, um, and it's still, agriculture still employs a fourth of Mexico's population, even after so many farm workers have been displaced. The majority of that is maíz, is corn, um, in milpa agriculture, which I'll go into. But there's two really great sayings which you might not be able to see, um, that are really popular in Mexico. One is, um, sin maíz no hay país, sin frijol pues tampoco. And that basically means, um, without corn, there's no country. Without beans, there's still no country. Those are really the two staples. Um, and that is, that's, that's the food that has really sustained cultures in Mexico for thousands of years. The other is, we created corn, and corn created us. And there's a lot of beautiful mythology um, and and uh, ideology around corn and how the corn stalk itself is kind of like the human, you know, it stands tall, it has limbs, it has hair, it has a head, you know, and there's this really beautiful human connection that has always existed with corn and will always exist with corn in Mexico. Plus, we love the things. So, <laughs> the U.S., has, the USDA um, has the Department of Agriculture has kind of said repeatedly that one of our greatest accomplishments is the market integration achieved by NAFTA. Um, that was in 2005. These are some authors, Letterman's have been, they worked for the World Bank, or they, they wrote this book actually for the World Bank Press um, in 2005 about lessons from NAFTA, what we can learn for the future. And they say that Mexico will gain more from NAFTA if traditional crops are abandoned in favor of cash crop exports and processed food. Basically they said, yeah, we screwed Mexico's corn market. They'll never be able to make a livelihood on the prices that they're now dealing with, and so many people have migrated, that they might as well just abandon traditional crops and focus on what's going to bring them money. And that's um, processed food, which has now we've seen, uh, well, I'll first say um, cash crop exports. <clears throat> How many of y'all shop at HEB? Or have gone to HEB? What is the vast majority of the fruits and vegetables you see? Where are they from? I mean, this is something we've seen like over the last 10 years really increase, and that's because that was the big transition. 
Mexico has a year-long seasonal growing period for produce, and it's easier for them with the, with the right supports, the bigger farms, to produce produce that we consume here. Um, the other is meat production. And uh, one of the things that we started exporting in huge quantities besides white corn was yellow corn. And that was used for feed. It wasn't used for feed in livestock production in Mexico before NAFTA, but now it is the primary feed. And as a result, we've seen factory farms in poultry and pork uh, open up in Mexico. That's contributing now to economic growth. So there's a lot of um, consequences to deal with when you talk about opening up these markets so quickly. One is the farming livelihood, and at the heart of our immigration debate is NAFTA. Marcy Kaptur said that recently in a video talking about um, the ongoing effects of super NAFTA, the highways we're seeing go through our, the United States uh, to truck more stuff back and forth. Um, immigration, absolutely, uh, this is key to the discussion. We'll get more into that. Um, vulnerable markets. So are there, there, the price of corn in Mexico is affected greatly by our low prices. What you did was lower the price so low that millions of farmers had to leave, and now the farmers who are farming are working on this low price. Well, then there's an ethanol boom. When the U.S. decided to use corn as a source of ethanol and fuel, the price skyrocketed. And that was good for the farmers who were still able to keep up with corn production, but it was really bad for everybody who eats tortillas, which is the vast majority of all of Mexico. And if you think about um, the, the majority of people living on $4 a day or less, uh, you know, middle class families and below, um, seeing your tortilla prices double when that's half of your caloric intake is traumatic. And that's something that they are still susceptible to. Um, then you have the centralization of farms. Again, bigger farms, fewer of them, more production, meat and produce as well. And then processed foods, which we'll get into. So a lot of what I studied was around 2008 changes in NAFTA, and one of those was the liberalization of sweeteners and of other processed foods. And when I say liberalization, I mean, again, the, the integration of the markets and the fact that our prices become their prices. The North American Free Trade Agreement liberalizes corn. January 1st, 1994 is when it really goes into the effect. Um, we sell all our extra corn in Mexico with a tariff rate quota transitioning system that doesn't really work. I would take time to explain it, but it wasn't actually implemented and Mexico lost at least $3.5 billion in uncollected duties that it could have taken um, on the extra corn that was dumped from the US. Um, the result of that is that the price was liberalized immediately. There was no disincentive for you with the US to dump all its corn. The price dropped about 70% over six to six to seven years, and 1.6 million farmers at least lost their livelihood within the first five years of NAFTA's implementation. This number is very arguable because it's the FAO the Food Agriculture Administration and INEGI, which is um, Mexico's kind of equivalent, really only has so much to work from in data. And you have a huge indigenous community um, in Mexico and many like semi-indigenous communities that don't necessarily show up on the census, et cetera. So, um, but what I wanted to point out here is that this is not the beginning of liberalization of the corn trade. And actually over, over 50 years, you kind of see Mexico go back and forth. Um, Mexico was a always has been a very agricultural community. And, um, and in the 1950s, uh, agricultural supports were really strong. The US gov or the, sorry, the Mexican government was trying to get irrigation on, on lots of farms and to get self-sufficiency. And then in the 70s, you saw, um, well, in the 60s and 70s, you saw that the Mexican government really wanted to invest in its cities and pull away from agriculture. So it started cutting spending in the fields. Um, then they had this huge rural poverty explosion where it was obvious that so much of their population was suffering because they couldn't make it, but their, their agricultural prices were not supporting them. So um, the Mexican government then reinstated this huge, uh, this program, Conasupo, which um, started feeding more into the, into the farm programs. And in, in 1981, Mexico achieved total self-sufficiency, no need to import any corn, plenty uh, of corn being grown. And uh, after that, they started cutting. And that's when you start to see privatization. It's really, it's kind of cool to know the, some of the Mexican Revolution history, and I can't go into that in, in depth, but one of the things that came out of the Mexican Revolution was the ejido system, which was, took you know, these huge farmland plots that were formerly haciendas, and, thank you, and made them into communal plots that couldn't be bought or sold or rented 
basically every family worked together on these communal lands. Now that had all kinds of problems too, because you had, you, there wasn't always a great balance of power there, but people had subsistence farming and that land couldn't be sold. In the 90, 1990s, that system was slashed. There was a, an amendment made in 1981 to the Mexican Constitution that abolished the ajito system to turn it over to private banks so that it could enter into the market to supposedly help you know, stimulate economic growth. Um, but the problem with that is if all of us are in a room and we all have a family and we have a very small plot of land and we chop it up in equal squares, we don't have much to work with when we're trying to get credit from the banks. The private banks didn't prefer to give credit to the small farmers. They preferred the larger farmers with less indigenous backgrounds who had access to more technology, more investment, who were likely to make it with a loan. And, uh, and that was a huge blow to rural farmers. Um, subsequently, that's when you saw a huge amount of migration from the farmlands. So the TRQ method I was talking about was basically where um, it was agreed that corn was going to be a devastating part of the agriculture agreement. So every, every 15, I'm sorry, every year, um, the amount of corn exported from the US to Mexico that could enter in duty free was increased a little bit. Basically, it meant like, okay, we can export this much corn. After that, Mexico's gonna tax it to slow it down. And the tax-free amount will increase every year until 2008 when it's phased out. Well, that's the money that was never collected. That's why it was pretty much immediately liberalized. But what did happen in 2008 was that all the cash payments Mexico was giving to its corn farmers were cut out completely. So you can see that we still have billions of dollars of subsidies here. There's absolutely no way to that it's an equal playing ground. Shots rang out in the mountains of Chiapas. The Zapatista movement started, and that's like one of the first, <laughs> one of the first examples of global activism we see. The University of Texas was a huge mouthpiece for that movement. Um, so it was widely known, um, and I wish I could go more into the Zapatistas, but there's about 20 books in here that you should pick up and read. If you're interested in that. Um, I know, because I see them all the time. Um, but basically, so the, so the Mexican government said, okay, we're gonna cap white corn imports, we're just gonna import yellow corn from the US. So yellow corn, again, is used for animal feed, and that started this whole industrial uh, livestock, poultry, and swine production. Um, so in the 90s, they start using the yellow corn. In 1994, the duties drop for corn, feed prices decrease, Mex uh, meat production increases in Mexico. The problem with this, in the economic standpoint, is that the price for meat imports from the US also dropped at the same time. And Mexico is dependent on us for feed. They're also importing a huge amount of cheap poultry and beef. So there's no way that they can really compete with the US in terms of meat production. Um, but you have seen this huge growth. And you can move on to the next one. Yeah, yellow corn imports and overall corn Im imports keep going up. And the problem with uh, importing yellow corn as an excuse for the white corn destruction uh, of the economies is that unfortunately they're substitutes in about a handful of things. Two main things, high fructose corn syrup and Fritos. Fritos actually use yellow corn, so when you eat, next time you eat Fritos, just remember you and the cattle in the field. <laughs> Too much difference between you. Um, so unfortunately those substitutes are, the, are enough for the price effects to be the same. So if yellow corn is super cheap, white corn is still going to be super cheap. So this really didn't ease the problem for farmers. Okay. Oh, and it doesn't even show. That's why I had this. This is Mac PC conflict. But um, I just wanted to show that due to a lot of different complicated things, the price of tortillas never actually went down with the price of corn. So you probably can't see this that well. But this is the price of corn plummeting from 93 to 2001. And this is the price of tortillas continuing to rise. So tough for farmers and tougher for consumers. Um, OK, so about 70% of the meat production and poultry production is accounted for by nine firms, three of them having 54% of the shares. Tyson is the largest. Tyson is a US company. Um, this is the big point here, is that you have foreign investment, you have growth of an industry, but it's not really a Mexican industry. Mm. It's Tyson creating more processed food, more mechanically deboned chicken, the ingredient you see in your Campbell's. Uh, instead of going to the market and seeing as many whole chickens, you see the chopped up chickens in styrofoam packaging. Again, more processed food flooding the market. The, the, one of the arguments the WTO tends to use for these agreements 
is this observation that when societies industrialize and develop, as the per capita income goes up, fewer traditional grains are eaten and more meat is eaten. So like in Japan, this meant like less rice, less wheat. As people started to make more money, they started to eat more meat and less ramen and less rice. Well, in Mexico, that's not the case. And if I could show you, I wish I could show you this graph. I probably have it in here. But basically, it shows your grains and your meat and everything. It's flat from 1970 to 2000. Tortillas are still winning, and so are beans. <laughs> and Mexicans are still eating the same amount of tortilla and beans that they always have, maybe with a slightly more meat. But the point is, it's still a staple, and it, it's still at the center of everything. But basically, uh, this, this section has to do with the tortilla subsidy program, and um, that was some major corruption and favoritism that I don't have time to go into, but um, uh, that was another way that traditional farmers got cut out and replaced by a, a newer company called Maseca and another one called Milsa. Instead of boiling the corn flour in uh, calcium carbonate, lime water, which um, is this magical process that makes the tortilla so good and so nutritious, um, they dehydrate it and freeze dry it and then rehydrate the corn flour into masa. And this is a really cheap way to get more tortillas out of the corn and to give it a longer shelf life. Well, it didn't really go so well in the market because if you ever had one of those really crappy corn tortillas that breaks when you fold it in half and really doesn't taste good, chances are it's maseca. So um, that didn't go so well, but the guy who started this company was really good friends with President Salinas' brother. Salinas is the one who signed NAFTA. Uh, they capped the amount of corn they were going to take from traditional farmers and any increase in demand for the tortilla subsidy program, which this is like the program that ensures cheap tortillas for most Mexicans in the cities, um, would be met with these new companies. And they get about a third of their corn from the US. So I really would just like everybody to take these impacts into consideration and talk to people, because so many people are really unclear on the details of NAFTA and why free trade agreements are so dangerous on the agricultural front. Um, but policy changes for biofuels, for example, really need to be made with these considerations. It screwed us over in food prices, but it really screwed over Mexico and anybody else who's depending on corn. Um, future free trade agreements, which we'll get to, Panama is being pushed hardcore by Charlie Rangel, uh, Ways and Means Committee, mm -hmm. right now, and we'll have a moment later for you to take some action on that. But there are also big challenges right now in the WTO, co the international courts to U.S. cotton subsidies. And um, if that pulls through, that could be major pro progress in, in kind of putting the brakes on some of these free trade agreements. <laughs> and then there's the protection of indigenous sovereignty. Because, like I said, there's a lot of people who are not on the radar in this whole debate. This is Morelos, Mexico, actually a town called Wayapan. It's up in the mountains, and um, the only way you can get into this town, the foothills of Popocatap, which is a giant volcano in south central Mexico, is to cross over this, this big ravine that drops about 500 feet down. And, um, and there are elders in there who will tell you that in their lifetime, at least twice, that town has blown up their own bridge. Um, to prevent people from coming in, whether they were the federales, the tax collectors. I kind of have a feeling they've been doing it since 1500. Um, the point <laughs> is, they all speak Nahuatl, their own language. They go in and out of the, of the city, um, but they still grow their own corn. It's definitely well, you said that the, the, pretty, the pretty produce comes here. Well, the pretty, yeah, the nice looking produce gets imported into the U.S., and that's what we see in our HEB. The nicest of that produce probably goes to my HEB at Hancock and not the HEB at Riverside and <laughs> Pleasant Valley. But that's job. another discussion that I think really is a big part of, of what's going to be talked about on the, on the 30th. I hope you'll come back um, for the third part of this, this justice series. Um, I'm talking about food access and the local response. But, um, but it's kind of interesting how you see a parallel there. You know, Mexico keeps the, the not so pretty produce and where does the where does it get doled out here? Um, it's a really good question. I'm going to start with um, CAFTA, naturally, and CAFTA being a natural transition south with the same promises that NAFTA gave to Mexico, CAFTA gave to the six Central American countries that were part of its agreement. And you can go ahead, go next. And um, Central America was an easy target for free trade in that it was still coming out of civil war. A lot of it was still wrought with the remnants of civil war, paying back debt, um, overcoming uh, structural adjustment programs that were, encouraged, that were encouraging economic growth in Central America. 
And Costa Rica was certainly not exempt from that. So when CAFTA and free trade policies moved south, Costa Rica was lumped in with a lot of countries that were going through very different things than Costa Rica at that same time. So Costa Rica, CAFTA, and learners of the Green Desert. And before we flip, I will just draw your attention to the photo. This is a march, an anti-CAFTA march that happened in Costa Rica, this was in February, and the national referendum in Costa Rica happened in November. So this was hotly debated in Costa Rica for years, three years approaching the national referendum. And I mean, Costa Rica is a small country. It's the size of <laughs> New Hampshire. I mean, you wouldn't see this many people in the streets. Maybe you would New Hampshire. But I, I mean, it's a lot <laughs> of people protesting CAFTA <laughs> in years prior to its vote. So. Okay, so who knows Costa Rica here? Yeah, that's right. It's, it's way popular among people, and so you probably know the pura vida attitude and everything that Costa Rica is sold for being, which it very much is. It's a paradise of all sorts. Um, Costa Rica is was the first country to abolish its army in 1948, which enabled it to have a very different destiny than a lot of Central American nations, in that it chose to, I guess, move its military spending into um, social security, into health care, and into education. Um, nearly 25% of its land mass is under federal protection, which is a statistic that Costa Rica loves to sell and is obviously a great success. I mean, if we can imagine the equivalent in the United States, 25% of our country in the national park is really impressive. It also lends, to really, uh, lends itself to really interesting dynamics outside of the park borders, where you will see development encroaching up to the sides of these natural reserves. I mean, hotels. Anyone who's been to Costa Rica, and especially recently, has seen this phenomenon. But it has made conservation um, a high priority. It possesses 0.1% of the world's land mass, but contains 5% of the world's biodiversity. It was very long ago in Costa Rica where the north and south land masses met. And so due to that, Costa Rica has an abundant, overwhelming, amount of species, flora, fauna, and is lush. I mean, there, there are more species in this small landmass than, I mean, it's one of the 20 highest in biodiversity in the world. So there's a lot of stuff there, and a lot of really valuable stuff there. Um, there are up to 12 climate zones. Um, again, Costa Rica is very small, but within this small country, you can find savanna, desert, mountains, um, volcanoes. I mean, it's, it's beautiful and an incredibly um, rich natural landscape. So, what makes Costa Rica unique? And when I say unique, I mean within Central America. And um, it's, it's been a democratic nation for more than 120 years, so it has benefited from the stability that other Central American nations have. It. And they've been working on economic development, social development, while other Central American countries were still fighting civil wars. This has allowed them to have high levels of education. The illiteracy is at 7.4%, 7.4%, which is higher than the US illiteracy rate, or lower, sorry. The, more of them read than us. <laughs> 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 Health coverage is really high. Um, it's a national health care system. Poverty is at less than 20%, which is also really amazing for the region. High economic standards, lowest uh, telecommunications rates in, on the continent, um, no standing army again. And the biggest nation in Central America with the biggest reserve of natural resources, that includes marine resources. Um, and this is all pre CAFTA, all of this information. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops and changes next. Thanks. So the Central American Free Trade Agreement, I'm not going to go into the details of what a free trade agreement is. You guys understand. If you're here, you probably have some understanding, and Carmen definitely laid it out. Um, it's a political tool used to create a free trade zone within CAFTA countries and the United States. So the, the countries here, and the Dominican Republic was added later. So CAFTA, Dr. CAFTA, or PLC. So where were you when CAFTA happened? I, s I spoke to a number of university groups that were visiting Costa Rica for um, like semesters abroad educational programs when I was down there. And it was amazing to me not only how few students knew of CAFTA or what CAFTA was, some of them knew of it as like a cousin of NAFTA, but how few professors even knew what it was. I mean, we had absolutely no involvement with CAFTA. We had no say in it. And so 
Yeah, I mean, you can hardly hold anyone accountable for not knowing. We, we, had, we played no role, and there really was no opportunity for us to play much of a role. Um, so the writing of CAFTA began here in 2004. In June 2008, the bill passed the Senate by a vote of 54 to 45, the thinnest margin ever for a trade agreement. And then in July 20, on July 28, 2005, the House passed the bill by two votes. And I don't remember, if, um, or I don't know if you guys remember seeing any news about that, that they, they held the vote open. Some of you are saying yes. They held the vote open for an extra hour, getting some Republicans who were, you know, being weak on the issue back onto the pro CAFTA side. So there was, I mean, there was a, a pretty large for CAFTA article in the New York Times the next day talking about the injustice of this and how unpopular it was in the face of NAFTA policies that weren't looking so good. Next. Okay, so why Costa Rica then? Um, in 2006, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala passed this bill immediately. And the free trade was, I mean, these countries really didn't blink an eye. I mean, they, 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 they accepted for this free trade agreement as soon as it entered into their country. I mean, again, their, um, their populations weren't involved, but they accepted it as soon as it came across their borders onto the table of um, their leading party. In 2007, the Dominican Republic did, and in that same month, Oscar Arias declared that Costa Rica would hold a national referendum, the country's first in October of the same year. So there was uh, impressive bipartisan opposition in Costa Rica. Um, for years leading up to this, I mean, when they knew that it was being drafted in 2004, Costa Ricans started protesting, which shows, obviously, I mean, reflects, I guess, this high level of education that there was in the country and also a high level of engagement. People were very concerned about understanding the depths of CAFTA, especially in comparison to what had happened in Mexico, Costa Rica also being a nation that was founded on campesino values and land holdings. And, um, so why the debate? I mean, if it wasn't clear from the previous slides, Costa Rica is really in a separate category in many ways from other Central American countries. And that is pretty evident on my next slide. No? Sorry, one after this. There's no words. Oh, there are facts. Awesome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, thanks. That's it. Um, so before CAFTA, Costa Rica was in a really good place. They had 94% of Costa Rican goods were entering the U.S. tax-free with the Caribbean Basin Initiative, which was their CAFTA. I mean, there certainly was trade policies, and I mean, similar to free trade policies already enacted in Costa Rica when the CAFTA debate was happening. So the U.S. paid import taxes on pro products into Costa Rica, though they were the lowest in the region. And the United States is Costa Rica's largest trading partner, or was in 2006, it still is, it's even more so now, accounting for 49% of the overall trade in 2006. So CAFTA promised to immediately reduce tariffs 80% with a 20-year phase-out plan for sugar, rice, and beans. But there were no crops in Costa Rica that competed in the same way that corn did with corn production in Mexico. So, there were a lot of, I mean, the, the worries in Costa Rica were diverse, and there certainly were a number of small and mid-range um, farmers that were concerned that they would be further pushed out by, by the implementation of CAFTA, but this had really been going on for a long time in Costa Rica. Costa Rica, despite having all, and I, I put the banana picture up there to remind me, despite having all of these wonderful achievements in social, social security, healthcare, and education, they also became very dependent on coffee exports in the 1970s. And when the coffee market crashed at the end of the 1970s, um, they too, like all other Central American countries, welcomed in the structural adjustment programs that were offered by the World Bank. So Costa Rica was in massive debt and looking to rebuild. And one way that they were allowed to do that was by these teaching loans that were given by the World Bank, which said, we'll give you money, but you need to put it into export agriculture, pushing supply-side economics, saying if we're giving you money, use it to cut down trees and plant something that you have um, an advantage on over, a competitive advantage on over the United States. And that was largely bananas. So the agricultural component had really already been put in place with the 1980s structural adjustment programs. Okay, this one should have been um, so Costa Rica's situation was vastly different from the other countries that were also being lumped into, lumped into CAFTA. 
And it was really important for Costa Rica to make it clear, and I say Costa Rica, the, the people who were very opposed to this in Costa Rica, to make it clear that there was not an opposition to the United States. There was not an opposition to free trade. They just really felt that they deserved a different kind of trade agreement than all of these countries that are, I mean, half the GDP, if that, I mean, of Costa Rica. So Costa Rica really was in the position of saying, how, how much is this really going to help us? And hence large protests in three years of debate. The Pura Vida attitude is very, very accepting, very everything's okay, life is good, and so there were a lot of um, jokes about the Pura Vida TLC that came out um, in the newspapers during, during the whole debate, basically saying, like, Costa Rica, don't let yourself be so Pura Vida about this really crappy free trade agreement, stand up for yourself. The Costa Rican Dream Team, which was the, um, the, or, uh, the group of politicians that was hired to um, <laughs> I guess the, the negotiated captive was exposed to have been, been funded by USAID. And that came out, that was huge, there were no buts about it, it was not, no I wasn't, yes you were, it was, yeah we were all funded by USAID and they all stepped down. So, <laughs> I mean it was very corrupt and very, um, I guess, behind closed doors to begin with. Um, CAFTA was deemed unconstitutional by the UCR, which is the University of Costa Rica, which is the largest university in Central America and Costa Rica, obviously. And that was later overturned by the Supreme Court saying, you know, like, let it go. Um, any free trade agreement does override the constitution of a country if it's accepted. So accusations of federal money used for campaign purposes and illegal donations received from outside Costa Rican borders. That happened a lot on both sides. And then a personal me memorandum received um, from the vice president to the president, Oscar Arias, the um, Nobel Peace Prize winner, was exposed. And this went out huge online. They published the full text in La Nación, the, the country's biggest paper. Basically, the VP said to the president in very clear writing, we need to scare people. This opposition movement is doing their job. And it's really looking like this isn't going to pass. So we need to scare them. And how are we going to do that? We're going to threaten the, govern, the governor of every canton, which is like a county, of every canton, that if they don't, if their canton doesn't pass, they will get no federal funding the following year, which you simply can't say, but they said it. I mean, this was something, a tactic that they were going to use. And this was printed you know, in the largest newspaper. They also said, this is becoming a fight of rich against poor people. And <laughs> with no, I mean, absolutely indiscreetly said, we need to get poor people's faces on our propaganda. So you need to get someone who looks like they're from a union, who looks like they're a farmer, and get them onto our marketing, you know, onto our marketing material. Also very clearly said. And then the third thing that they said, or what was the third thing that they said? Um, oh yeah, and then the, um, the ambassador from the US said, if you don't approve uh, CAFTA, we're gonna pull out all trade. Um, all trade agreements that we have, which would of course take an active Senate um, in the United States and was totally unrealistic, but these were like announcements that he was publishing in the local papers. So there was a lot of scandal. This was a country that was ready to say to the biggest economy in the world, no thanks. Like, we really think that we're doing all right on our own. So it was incredibly inspirational and of course really disappointing that they came that close. That's the president, by the way, Oscar. Yes, that was on the day that the referendum passed. But, positives that came out of it, it really set a precedent for future free trade movements and that people saw that this tiny country of Costa Rica could say no and came really close to saying no and exposed all of these reasons for saying no that made a lot of sense. And so as Panama and as South Korea and Colombia get ready to negotiate their free trade agreements, they're definitely looking at what people were opposed to in Costa Rica and why this, you know, stable democracy came so close to saying no to the superpower. So I did this project. I was living in the Saturpiki region and got really interested from an environmental agricultural perspective on banana plantations and took my camera interested for me in taking, you know, doc not really documenting, but just out of interest, um, you know, snapping pictures of the way that these people lived. And I, I made three trips out there, maybe four during, the, during my last year in Costa Rica, and was just profoundly impacted by these, the human connections in Costa Rica to the bananas that we all eat, pretty mindlessly. I mean, regardless of where they come from, um, the processes that are used to, to get us these bananas, and the way that the people live, 
who are putting them in boxes for us. So um, that was where this story came from, I guess, essentially. And I'm just going to read you, because I think it's a little more fluid, just read you, um, in English, obviously, the um, parts of this that I think will illustrate. The farther the bus traveled away from Puerto Viejo, the more disoriented I became. To all horizons, blue plastic sacks dangled beneath an ocean of green banana leaves. The three known dimensions of Costa Rica fell into the distance. The bus rattled forward along the bumpy gravel road. Saving small chatter in the gravel displaced by the occasional passing vehicle, La Colonia is silent. Dark silhouettes wander within the desolate surroundings, cement buildings baking in the <coughs> afternoon heat. Um, the majority of Caruana's workforce is comprised of single male men. Uh, single men? <laughs> a single female man. Single men who live in baches. Reflective of plantation dynamics, the baches are simple, single room dormitories constructed for transitional occupancy. Single male workers are the in the highest abundance and arguably, arguably the most dispensable. The men sleep on slabs of wood placed over simple metal frames. Many of the doors hang from hinges that are broken and rusted from the humidity. Aside from some shoddy built wooden shelves and a lonely curtain rod, the bedrooms are empty. You can see that there. At 4.30 p.m., meals are served at the Fonda, the community's established cafeteria. Most men carry no extra weight. Their lean figures bear witness to arduous labor. Dinner finds the workers in near silence at the long communal tables, ingesting, in, ingesting valuable nutrients that will sustain them through another day of work. They will rise at three o'clock the following morning. The darkness is still, is still and fresh when the alarms begin to sound. The locks begin to rattle and one by one in haphazard synchronization, the men open their doors into the darkness. Most emerge with toothbrushes hanging from their mouth while some have already lit their first cigarette of the day. Underneath glowing constellations, the scent of gallo pinto, a typical Costa Rican dish of rice and beans and coffee, lead, leads them towards the fonda. They eat quickly and disper disperse to their respective fingers. On Saturday night, the scene is different. Faced with a full day of rest for most on Sunday, workers take to the local pool hall, community salon, or the entertainment room at the end of Bache 15, equipped with chess tables and the Bache's only public television. Laughter rides over the salsa music radiating from the community salon. Sunday, the village of La Colonia rests. The men normally seen in worn t-shirts, tall socks, and rubber boots are hardly recognizable with their hair combed, wearing jeans, collared shirts, and sombreros. Every man at Cariwana has a story to tell. A typical afternoon will see workers from the ages of, eight, of 18 to 55 crouched beneath the limited shade of the Bache awnings. Their smile and they smile and share stories of home, the revolution in Nicaragua, gold mining in the Osa Peninsula of southern Costa Rica, a love lost in Santa Cruz, Guanacaste, and all the mundane details of the day's work. One worker stands out to me. The body of Jose Rafael Zuniga Ruiz is so fragile, so unimposing, that it's easy to pass him by without, make, without taking much notice. Known as Rafa among coworkers, he was first employed by the banana plantation at 18. At 45, he still resides in the Baches of Caruana, uh, incapacitated by an accident incurred in the field. Rafa speaks openly about why he believes so many young men arrive at the plantation. Young men without necessary the necessary education or financial resources are powerless in pursuing what they truly want, he explains. The plantations represent the only viable option for young men in a young men in need of an income. As one of 13 siblings, Rafa felt the responsibility, if not the obligation, to leave his house in the slums of the capital San Jose. Now, with a certain sadness, he explains that he had envisioned a different future. I had dreams, he said, that didn't include the plantations. With tired eyes and weathered skin, he gazes through the broken glass of his window. Sometimes I look at all the cables that stretch across the, across the plantation and wonder, is there some part of me in all of this? In many ways, banana plantations such as Cariwana seem like foreign land in both physical and psychological terms. The monocropped islands of banana plantations abutted by lush, diverse rainforest ecosystems hardly seem natural. Nor does the fact that the plantation owner's policies and the final destination of the fruit all lie beyond Costa Rican borders. 
The so-called loners of the green desert represent the forgotten human component of a complex and burned chain of production. Despite the perceived distance of the consumer, their existence is implicit in every step of the chain. In the spaces these workers occupy, the factories they frequent, the soil they traverse, the plants that they grow, and the fruit that they harvest. Costa Rica has two distinct seasons, wet and dry. The growing season is continuous. The weather patterns change every six months. A bunch of bananas can be harvested every nine, and workers are generally contracted at Carivana every three. Payday comes every 15 days, and the bus to Puerto Viejo leaves the Fonda every 30 minutes. I climb aboard the bus and return to the three known dimensions of Costa Rica. And this is Teotitlan del Valle, which is right in the mountains outside of Oaxaca. And it also is where, if any of you guys have been keeping up on GMO contamination in Mexico, they recently found GMO contamination in the hills of Oaxaca, Mexico, which is, I mean, the cradle of corn in Mexico. So, I mean, GMOs are obviously way off the radar of, you know, the Zapotec village of Teotitlan, but a very real threat, considering that the government still denies that they're in Mexico. And this is your backyard. This is Austin. This is Urban Roots, and this is a very... A uh, sustainable and optimistic alternative to, um, yeah, industrialized agriculture. This is a local food system. These guys, I mean, a lot of you are probably familiar with Urban Ritz, and they will be talking April 30th, I believe, here. So come back and see them. But these are kids from East Austin. Uh, so this all would really uh, fall under what I guess I've been working on in some sense, uh, I guess all my life in some sense, since I work, grew up on this little small hog farm, but, you know, what I would call conservation, with an emphasis on con conservation, and development of sustainable community, sustainable livelihoods. I think that's uh, what we're all about. We want, we want to develop sustainable communities, and obviously in those communities we need strong, sustainable livelihoods. And then, you know, I, I did play around with some words uh, on a trip to West Texas once, I was going to give a talk, and I, I uh, was always telling my students that we're all applied ecologists. We're interacting with the environment to, to get things, to get money, to get food, fiber, shelter, recreation, whatever. We're all applied ecologists. I want you guys to be uh, positively ethical applied ecologists. And, and so then I just played with it and came up, you know, well, we need peace. And so positively ethical applied community ecologists, that's where that, that <laughs> uh, came from. Um, I uh, really, what, what, what I think I'm going to talk about is this business of all of us wanting to, to have security. And if we've had it, or if we have it, a sense of place, a sense of community. We all want, you know, if, if indeed we have had it, or if we do have it, uh, a sense of place, a sense of community, sustainable livelihoods. Uh, and then, of course, what we've been talking about tonight, and I'll talk a little bit about my history, is how the powerful can threaten us in various kinds of ways. You know, how, how power can threaten us. And then maybe, this is kind of an arrogant statement, but maybe I might touch on a few uh, solutions uh, or ideas for solutions. Not really. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But uh, we'll talk about a few things that maybe we could do. Uh, things that are obvious to all of y'all, I know, and probably more obvious, I, I know a lot of y'all are more active and activist types than I. Uh, they, they, one story popped into my head as I was thinking about this business of the, the good food coming to the States and the, the poor quality food staying in Mexico. Uh, I remember back in the 70s, I worked for this uncle who uh, had you know, quite a bit of power in, in that little local South Texas area that I was working in. Uh, he was a, 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 a middleman of sorts and, and contracted with farmers to grow all kinds of vegetables. We had a popcorn deal uh, in the Pearsall, Dilly, Millet area, South Texas. Uh, what had happened is in the Midwest they had uh, had a, a crop failure. I don't remember the specifics of it on popcorn. And so uh, folks from Jiffy Pop came down and, and contracted some popcorn acres because, you know, we, we grow it, uh, comes off a little earlier, and maybe they could meet some of their commitments. So we did have a popcorn deal, and I can remember these old 
uh, agriculturists, uh, farmer types, uh, workers in the mill, uh, talking about who raises the best corn. Of course, you know, us Texans, we raise the best quality <laughs> corn. Well, the Midwesterners, you know, we raise, the, we raise the best corn. Of course, we use a lot of corn, or have in the past used a lot of corn from the Midwest. You know, we, we're all, Texas is a lousy place to grow things, except for grass and trees. I can make the, I, I can make the, and you know, I'm talking about, you know, grass like the cows eat. Uh, but anyway, uh, if, if you go uh, west of I-35 and, and 281, uh, going towards Corpus, or 37 going towards Corpus, what we grow well is, is grass. And of course, we feed that through cows. Uh, I guess we could, in some areas, up on the plains, we could feed it through buffaloes, but we generally feed it through cows. And then you go east, and we grow trees real well. Otherwise, you know, when we try to grow things, we have hailstorms and hurricanes and uh, droughts, and uh, you know, we lose crops regularly. So we do receive a lot of subsidies, you know, because of that. Uh, Disaster, you know, you know, you know the game. Uh, disaster payments, uh, all kinds of bailouts that we get, and of course we are getting grain in from from the Midwest a good bit. And so these, you know, old, I remember Mr. Doyle saying that that grain is the lousiest stuff we get from the Midwest. And of course these guys from the Midwest said, "Well, you think we're going to send you our best stuff? You know, we use it first and send you send all the junk." I think that says something about power. I mean, the Midwest does, you know, that their soils are deep. They can throw the seed out there and grow it, so to speak. Whereas here in Texas, we have really work to grow it. Except maybe in the Trinity uh, Brazos River bottoms area. But uh, the Midwesterns, Westerners have, you know, a lot of grain, and, and I think probably we did get their crap, you know, sent to us regularly. So what, what I'd like to, uh, uh, lead y'all with a little bit is this business of, of power and how it affects our livelihoods. Now I, I grew up in Divine, Texas. Most, most of my formative years were in Divine, Texas, which is 30 miles south of San Antonio. When I was growing up in the 50s and the 60s, I left, you know, I graduated from high school in 1964, that community was, was very diversified. We had broom corn, watermelons, vegetables, uh, we, we grew some grain sorghum, uh, corn, it was a very diversified agricultural community. And of course, cow-calf operations, uh, a few people would have goats. So it was a very diverse uh, community. Uh, not only, obviously, because of free trade and free trade agreements, obviously, that, uh, but because of this business of uh, industrial, this movement to industrial ag that we, we got into after World War II. As a result of Reaganomics, as a result, you know, I, I can even blame this uh, savings and loan crisis. You know, I won't go into how that all influenced all this, but the savings loan, loan and loan crisis during those Reagan years, uh, uh, and a number of other factors that I've got listed here that I can't really remember right now. But uh, you know, this this whole business of the you know, sorry about the uh, University of Chicago, but the Chicago boys and trickle down economics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Friedman and all of that business. As a result of that, uh, if you go back to Divine right now, it's a bedroom community for uh, San Antonio. That's basically what it is. Now there are cow-calf operations there. There's still a little bit of vegetable production, but for the most part, it's just a bedroom community. We lost that. Uh, some of, some of us got together about three years ago over at my mom's house, and I remember Robert Cruz. I used to work. Uh, my dad. Uh, we just we actually only had about five acres in Divine. We raised a lot of hogs on that five acres. Uh, uh, always had a big garden. Always had a milk cow. Always, you know, raised a calf to slaughter. Uh, we did have another 140 acres over in the Stockdale area, but it was so dry. This was in the drought of the 50s. Mm -hmm. None of y'all really remember the drought of the 50s, <laughs> but I do, because toward the end of the drought, you can just go out, you know, push over big trees. What, what we were encouraged to do, of course in our high school years was to go off to some big university. I went to Texas A&M, I'm sorry, no, I'm not here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I went to, uh, to Texas A&M, uh, others went to University of Texas, et cetera, et cetera. I went, of course, to the Vietnam War. Uh, they were less fortunate. Uh, 
uh, and I came kind of close myself. But uh, anyway, we, we were encouraged to, to get out there and make money and consume. Mm -hmm. Now in this stimulus package, we're, you know, just like Mr. Mr. Bush after 9-11, we're continuing to do, to be encouraged to what? Consume. Uh, so I think that uh, no matter whether we're in uh, Mexico, Central America, parts of Central America, or South Texas, uh, particularly if we're in that part of society that has some power that, and that could possibly use somewhere in the area of we're using, you guys are using somewhere in the area of 100 to 200,000 calories per day. They're really kilocalories, but we call them calories, right? I don't know about that, right? They're really kilocalories, but we call them calories with a big C. Y'all are using per day 100 to 200,000 uh, kilocalories per day. Not just food, but air conditioning, clothes, cars, whatever. Those folks in Oaxaca, uh, a lot of folks that we saw there in Costa Rica, uh, folks that I've interacted with in Guatemala, folks that I've interacted you know, with in some areas of Brazil, uh, are only using maybe 10,000 kilocalories per day. Now remember, we're using what? Probably closer to 200,000. That's kind of the, the average of what we use in the United States. But I'm figuring, you know, y'all are closer to 100. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. the average in the United States is probably 200,000. Uh, those, those folks down there, if, if they're making $1 to $2 a day, they're, on, they're only using probably closer to 5,000, maybe 10,000. What we've got to do is come up with incentives, disincentives, a policy, whatever. We've got to get rid of things uh, that are really causing some serious problems like NAFTA and CAFTA and, and some of the things that EU is doing. Uh, we've, we've got to move them closer to 50 to 60,000 kilocalories per day so they, they can have a quality of life. It does take some resources, it does take some calories to have quality of life. And what do we need to do? All of us. We need to come down. We need to have closer to you know, no more than maybe a hundred square feet of home. Huh? I mean, not a hundred, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It might not be bad. It might not be bad. It might not be bad. What I, what I meant to say was a thousand. Y'all all know that we have to come down. We can talk about, uh, you know, all kinds of CAFTA and NAFTA and, and, and uh, efforts to rectify those but we have to come up with some kind of, of way to really change our lifestyle and change their lifestyle and help them to change their lifestyle. So, just kind of listing some things that I think we need to do. Obviously, we need to target the poor with resources in local grassroots participatory uh, ways, empower those folks. I know y'all have all heard this. I know you, you, you've heard the mantra that we have to do that, but we've really got to get serious about it. We need to, uh, when we go into an area, and, and that includes development of any area in the United States, we do need to cautiously and tentatively appraise the local state of social, political, economic, and hence ecological systems. Okay? Before we move in and, and, and pass CAFTAs and NAFTAs, or, or do stimulus packages for that matter, now, I know we've got to keep the system, keep that plane of flying, you know, and we don't want it to crash. But even these, even these darn st stimulus packages, before we, we act, we've got to do a better job of what the impact is really going to be on local traditions, cultures, sense of community, sense, sense of, uh, you know, quality of life, whatever, here and in other places. And we don't do much of that. We, we don't have time to stop. Wanted to talk, you know. I raced up here to make it by six o'clock today. And didn't even make it, but you know, I'm not saying I practice what I preach. We've got it, we've got it. but I try, and that's important. And I know y'all all try too. Number three, we've got to grow food, fiber, and shelter locally with local inputs and market it locally. You know, when when we move food all over the world, where is that? Where are those nutrients going? They're going to the city. They're going. To, Where's the P and the K going? Where's a lot of that organic matter going? It's going to the city. Do we get it back there to the Palouse? Well, obviously plants do 
do photosynthesis, capture a lot of carbon and put a lot of, put a heck of a lot of uh, organic matter back in the soil because there, there is, even though it's uh, less, much less than 1%, there's still a lot of carbon up there in the atmosphere. But we're exporting things like P and K. I used to work in this feed store back in Divine, Texas, back in the 50s and the 60s. Actually, that, my dad had me working in this feed mill that my uncle had, had started on the page. <laughs> the agriculture entrepreneur. But I used to work in that feed mill, and the fertilizer I used to recommend as a kid, as a kid in middle school and in high school, I used to recommend to farmers, kind of ridiculous, you know, but I used to recommend what they should fertilize with. Of course, we were using commercial fertilizers, not organic. But what do you think we, we were recommending mostly? It was 1620. Oh, 1620. Oh, what's the 16? Nitrogen. What's the 20? Phosphates. 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 And what's the O? Potassium. Potassium. Potash. We had a lot of potash in Texas soil. But what do you do over time? You're shipping all the potash. Now, of course, we were also trying to increase yields, so we added the potash later on. But we had a lot of potash in Texas soil. The resource limit, limited, the disenfranchised. You've got to target them with resources and energy and target them with ways of using that local energy in, in, a, in an ethical kind of way. So always, number one, when you think sustainability, don't think about those, those uh, well, do think about those poor uh, <laughs> organisms there in Costa Rica, because they are also poor and powerless, right? So, uh, and, and, I, and I usually do that when I can't believe I did that. But target the poor, not only the poor humans, but the poor that are other species. And, and, Protect valued ways of life, old traditions, sustainable agricultural practices, biodiversity, topsoil, uh, quantities of quality water, et cetera, et cetera, all, all that we know. So uh, there may be in NAFTA, in CAFTA, in a lot of what the EU is doing, and other agreements that y'all know more about than, than I do, there may be some efforts in their tactics to protect the environment. There may be at least some token efforts. You, know, you can read those agreements. There's some, there's some fairly good sounding stuff in there, you know, about protecting the, the lo they don't say it this kind of way, but protecting the local social fabric and protecting the environment. There's stuff in there. There's good stuff in there. Really, you know, y'all know that in those agreements. But in reality, in the overall strategy, Y'all know from what Carmen and Eva and Thea uh, presented, and overall, what are they doing? They're moving us away from where they say, you know, they, they might be trying to help uh, protect us. Everyone needs to have a good, strong, sustainable livelihood. Okay, and what I what what, what I mean by that, I don't know that I don't know for I'm not really sure that Bill Gates. Or Warren Buffett, you know, really have, in fact, I know they don't have a sustainable livelihood. If it were a sustainable livelihood, you know, they, they would be working with the, the, the earth and the, the dirt, and they certainly wouldn't be making enough, and they wouldn't have that power to, to consume probably, what, uh, a thousand, a thousand, you know, a bunch of kilocalories. <laughs> Way too much power in terms of... Uh, when, when you've got that much, any time, I mean, let me start this all over because I don't think I'm doing a very good job with it. Any time you create an artificial environment, you're destroying nature. If you've got someone with that kind of house, that kind of resources, that kind of power over resources, that is not sustainable. Uh, that's obviously kind of a problem with this free enterprise capitalistic system we have. I know some folks say we can do it through that system, but, but there is a, some real inherent problems with this system that we're trying to make work. And I voted for Obama, but I've got some real problems with what we're doing right now in terms, you know, not that I'm any kind of great ecological economic, uh, economist, but gosh, we're, we're, you know, we're telling people to go out there and support, you know, the auto industry, uh, we're, we're supporting things that we should definitely be against. Now I realize, I do realize that we don't want anarchy 
possibly, and chaos and whatever. <laughs> Some of y'all do, I know. <laughs> That's why I'm so hesitant when I say that. <laughs>